Thank you so much. It's really fantastic to be here. Um, I am here today for a very simple reason, um, and that's because there is something very fundamental uh, that is shaping the way that every single one of us is interacting with the world around us. That thing <laughs> is data. And in a second, in a second you're going to see the word data just gin ginormous on that. Uh, that thing is data. And uh, I've been spending most of my professional life working with data, which uh, uh, I co-founded a company called RJ Metrics, and what we do is we help online businesses sort through their data, their mountains and mountains of data, and extract some value from it. Um, and when you think about data, what image that kind of conjures up is exactly that. It's a geeky guy like me kind of sitting in a dark room, crunching through ones and zeros for some huge corporation. Uh, in the last 10 years or so, there's been a fundamental shift in what data really is and what data really means to all of us. And the power of data has moved from being something that's a tool of governments and large corporations down not just to our clients who are small businesses, but also to consumers and kind of to the end users and to every single one of us here. Now, I'm here today to talk about data and to talk about why this is such a big thing, this fundamental shift. And any question about how big data is leads to the question of just how much data is out there. There have been a few studies where people have kind of tried to come up with answers to that question. One of the ones that is most popularly cited came out of UC Berkeley a few years back. Uh, they tried to add up all the data created since the dawn of civilization, and they came up with a number, and that number was five exabytes of data. And when I tell people this fact, they say, wow, what the hell is an exabyte? <laughs> So I'm happy to break that down for you. There is this thing that I'm sure many of you have heard of in computer science that we call a byte. And a byte is a fundamental unit of measurement of data. Conveniently, a byte is also the amount of space required to store one character. So this letter A takes up a byte of storage. So what I'm going to do for the next few slides is with every slide, I'm going to zoom out a thousand times just to give you a sense of the scale we're talking about. So let's zoom out. There it goes. Our A is getting really small. And here we are at a thousand bytes with this thing we call a kilobyte. A thousand bytes is a thousand characters. It's about a half a page of text, OK? Zoom out another thousand times. We arrive at this thing called a megabyte. Now we're at a million bytes. Things start to get interesting here. A 500-page book can fit into a megabyte. You can store a decent quality photograph. You can store about a minute of audio in a megabyte. We zoom out yet another thousand times, and we arrive at this thing called a gigabyte. Our uh, esteemed host just bought a gig of something uh, to add to his email. It was one of these things, these gigabytes. Forget about storing texts and images at this point. You could fit the entire Encyclopedia Britannica, photos, text, and all easily inside of a gigabyte. The photo I have here is representative of the human genome. This is every single piece of information about a person defined at a genetic level, their entire DNA map. You can fit easily inside of a single gigabyte of space. A person, in a way, is about a gigabyte. But we zoom out yet again, another thousand times. And we arrive at this thing called a terabyte. Now, a terabyte, we're at a trillion bytes right now. Um, so you might argue, OK, a person can't be defined just by their genome. What if you videotape their entire life? What if you walked around with a video camera every waking minute of their life for a year, and you uploaded it to YouTube? YouTube could store that video in about a terabyte of space. So in about 80 terabytes of space, you could film every single waking minute of the average human's life. That's how much space we're talking about here. But we zoom out yet again, another thousand times, and we arrive at this thing called a petabyte a quadrillion bytes. This is a picture of the Amazon rainforest. If you went to the Amazon rainforest, which is about 1.4 billion acres of trees at about 500 trees an acre, and you chopped them all down, and you turned them all into paper, and you filled up every single sheet of paper with text, you would have created between one and two petabytes of information. That's a lot of data. And we zoom out yet again, one more time, we arrive at one quintillion bytes, and now, now, we're at the exabyte. So when we go back to our original quote here, which tells us that it was five exabytes of information created between the dawn of time and 2003, you understand that that is a pretty, pretty tremendous number. One of the places that I heard this study cited very recently was in a speech given just a few months ago by Eric Schmidt. He's the CEO of Google. It's a company that knows a little something about data. He had an interesting punchline. He said, yes, it's true. There was five exabytes of information created between the dawn of civilization and 2003, but it's not 2003 anymore, it's 2010. And guess what? That much information is now created every two days. Every two days, 
right here, right now, we are creating as much information as was created from the dawn of time until 2003. How did this happen? What has changed in the last couple of years? I can break it down into three things. The first is our ability to store data. Now, I talked about Google before. When the founders of Google in 1998 decided to create the company, uh, they made a bold move. They maxed out their credit cards and they spent $20,000 on hard drives. They bought 100 hard drives. They filled up the back seat of a car. They wired them all together. They downloaded the entire internet onto them and this became Google's brain. Last week I went on Amazon.com and I bought this thing. This is a standard laptop form factor hard drive. It holds one terabyte of data. It cost me about 100 bucks. This holds more data than every single one of those hard drives combined. And I got free shipping. <laughs> Look at what's happened at our, to our ability to store data. That orange line is an exponential decay in the cost of storing data. The other line is an exponential growth in the amount of data that fits on a hard drive about the size I just showed you. Tremendous, two exponential effects combining, allowing us to do just tremendous, tremendous storage of data inexpensively. Just storing data is not enough though. Let's talk about distribution of data, our ability to move it from place to place. Sure, the internet's been around for more than 10 years, but what has changed in the last couple of years is how wide the pipe is. That pipe that we push the internet through for the average person has grown again exponentially. This is a uh, image that represents the US consumer bandwidth per capita. The ability of not just everyone, but anyone to move data has grown at a tremendous rate. And it's important to note, this is not just a US phenomenon. This chart is from the US, but this is happening globally. And in fact, the United States trails many, many other nations in the advent of broadband. Number three, and most importantly, in my opinion, is creation. Our ability to create and capture new data. I'm sure that every single person in this room has a cell phone of some kind. But it's not just a phone, is it? It is a multi-sensor data capturing and creation device. It is a camera, it's a video camera, it's a GPS navigation system, it's a video conferencing system if you've got the new iPhone 4. It is all of these things combined. It's something that you could sit down with in an afternoon and create more data than your great grandparents probably did in their entire lifetimes. So to answer the question, how did this happen? I have a slightly simpler version. The fact of the matter is that uh, that we did it. We did it. All of us right here, right now, sitting in this room, brought on this change. And we did it by leaving data exhaust behind us. Everywhere that we go, there's this thing called data exhaust. And you might say, oh, you might say, hey, I I'm not that guy who updates my Twitter every five minutes. Uh, I am that guy, by the way. Uh, <laughs> I'm not one of the people contributing to this. Well, guess what? Twitter's nothing. And Facebook, while we're at it, it's very close to nothing. It's a drop in the bucket. When's the last time you swiped a credit card, rode public transit, maybe walked by a security camera? When's the last time you had a doctor's visit, the last time you made a donation to charity or paid your taxes? Every single one of these things creates data. And where that data used to just kind of evaporate because of the revolution in creation, storage, and distribution, it's now being captured, maintained, and mined. And to some of you, that may sound scary, but to me, that is extremely, extremely exciting. <laughs> and let me tell you why. If you look back throughout the course of human history and look at times of tremendous progress, very, very commonly, they were preceded by advances in humankind's ability to create, store, or transmit data. Look at the printing press, which not coincidentally came at the advent of the Renaissance and the scientific revolution that shortly followed. Within science, look at the microscope, this new tool for capturing data and understanding information at a far, far more molecular level brought on a revolution in medical technology that's added decades to the average human lifespan. Even more recently, uh, look at World War II and the, in, the invention of the field of operations research, which is a, which is a statistically based uh, solution for managing logistics, uh, managing manufacturing and distribution. Operations research helped the Allies win the war, and after the war, it came home and helped bring on a time of tremendous growth in the American economy. The fact of the matter is that what's happening today with data is of equal or greater magnitude than any of those examples that I just gave. How is it going to impact us right here, right now, today? Well, it already is, and the best example that I can give you is the other talks that you've seen here today, the other TED talks that you've seen on online. Take a look at them and listen for these key words, for data, for information, 
for statistical analysis, for trends. What's changed in the last couple of years has enabled people in the fields of medicine, of education, of agriculture, everywhere, to do a better job, be smarter, and most importantly, innovate and find new approaches to solving big problems. Big data is here, and I very much encourage you to get excited about it. Because when people ask me, Bob, are we in the middle of a data revolution right now? Is this a revolution we're experiencing? I say, no. The data is not the revolution. The data will enable the revolution. And today's data is enabling tomorrow's progress. We're watching it happen, and it's just the tip of the iceberg. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.